please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, John chapter 12. We will be finishing John chapter 12 today. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you. You can grab that and go to page 621, and there you'll find John chapter 12. And today, I will be preaching beginning in uh, verse 36, and we'll finish the chapter out. As you turn there, I want to tell you, as we were singing, I was reminded and struck by how, just how Christ-centered our worship is and how well put together the service flows and links to the sermon. And so I just want to say thanks to Philip for always praying and reading the text that I'll be preaching and, and picking these songs. Uh, if you haven't thanked Philip, you need, to, you need to be thankful for him and, and go up to him and tell him how much you appreciate him. Because I can tell you, within 100 miles of here, there's not another church singing the songs we sing. So thank Philip. Um, take your time to thank him. We have a great worship service, and that's because he spends a lot of time thinking about it and preparing for it. So I'd ask you to stand now as we prepare to worship the Lord in listening to his word proclaimed and in preaching his word. John 12, beginning in verse 36. A, I guess it would be in your Bible, says this, When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to the world, come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Hindsight is 2020. Everyone knows what that means, right? Hindsight is 2020. You've heard the phrase. It means 2020 vision. Your vision is perfect after the fact. You can look back. And you can analyze and you can see perfectly maybe what you should have done, what you should not have done, how things could have been different. Hindsight is 2020. And because hindsight is 2020, we're prone as humans to do what's called an act, after action review. You may never heard it in that term, but I assure you, you've done an after action review. They're, they're often formal, but they're usually informal in your everyday life. You do them all the time after something happens in your life. Um, you look back at this relationship, and you analyze it, and you say, uh, things should have gone differently, they could have gone differently, uh, maybe I should have acted this way, or maybe a job, whatever it is, we just, we're prone to doing them, doing them all the time. 
they're formalized. We do, them, we do them all the time in a very formal setting. The Army loves to do it after action review. I'm sure the Air Force does, Marines, Navy, everybody. After an engagement, after an exercise, everybody gets together, high-ranking NCOs and officers, and they analyze what just happened and what could we have done better and what will we do next time. Coaches do this with their players all the time. And if the baseball season comes and if it's a good coach, the coach will bring him in and he'll say, here's your strengths and here's your weaknesses, here's how the season went, here's what we need to do for next season. Uh, the end of my dissertation is upon me and so on Friday I'll be in California defending the work that I've done and I'll sit there before this board and I'll tell them, we'll reflect on the project and we'll say, here's why I did it, here's what Here's how it went, here's how things could have been different, here's the effect on the congregation. We're prone to doing these after action reviews. When it comes to where we are in our text, I think what we see here is it's the end of Jesus' public ministry, and we have John giving us two, two summations of Jesus' public ministry. His public ministry ends, and we know it does because our text says, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid themselves from them. And that's the end of his public ministry. From the rest of the gospel, from 13 on, it's Jesus privately with his disciples, teaching them this incredible massive theology we'll see, but preparing them for what's going to happen, preparing them for future ministry. It's just Jesus and his disciples up until his arrest and crucifixion. His public ministry is over, and John gives us a summation of all that came before in Jesus' public ministry in these two main sections. It's an after-action review of sorts. These two summary statements, one you'll see in 36 through 43, is Jesus' public ministry was marked by widespread unbelief. And then, 44 through 50, Jesus' public ministry was marked by clear gospel invitations. So that's what we'll see today is these two summary statements of Jesus' public ministry. The text is one of the most challenging, I think, in all of John's uh, gospel. That's what's before us today. It will challenge what you believe about, to be true about God. There are a lot of things informing us about what we believe about God from the time that we are children, many of which don't come from the Bible. They come from the culture. They may have come from your parents who learned that from their parents. And so a lot of what we know about God may be informed by tradition. And what we have in our text today is something that challenges our beliefs about God and can even challenge your public proclamation that you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. You say, I believe that the Bible is inerrant. It has no errors. It's inspired by God, every word. Then we run into texts like this today that can really challenge us. So this text is, I think, very critical and important. It will no doubt collide with pride. It'll force you to reexamine what you believe to be true about God challenge cultural ideas and perceptions about how God governs the world, what we believe to be true about God's sovereignty over belief and unbelief. A lot of big things in this text this morning. My purpose is, as we lay out these two summary statements of Jesus' public ministry, my hope is that you would submit to God's word. And by submitting to God's word, you would see God as he truly is, and you would be compelled to believe. Now, that you would understand why people don't believe, for sure. You need to understand why people don't believe. And then you need to examine your own heart for unbelief. And if you are believing already, then it is simply my hope that this text would do what John intends it to do, which is to help God's people to continue and remain in belief and persevere. So let's look at these two summary statements of Jesus' public ministry. First, Jesus' public ministry is marked by unbelief, widespread unbelief. Look back at your text, these words in verses 36 through 43, they're all about unbelief. 
We're told at the very beginning of John's gospel that this would happen. If you remember, the prologue kind of tells us all of the theology and the themes that will unfold through the rest of the gospel. And we were told at the very beginning that Jesus' ministry was marked by rejection and unbelief with this statement in John 1.11. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him. Despite having so much revelation, more revelation than any people that have ever lived on the face of the earth, they have Jesus' words spoken. They have the re clear revelation of the glory of God in the face of Christ. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. The people <coughs> did not believe. The people did not believe. They persist in unbelief. I'm going to take a cough drop, so better watch out on the front row, because it might come flying out. We'll see how this goes. <coughs> the people persist in their unbelief. Despite all of this revelation, and that's what we're told here in our text, aren't we, in 1237? If you look back at your text, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Now, there was no doubt many different excuses that people gave for not believing in Jesus. You can see some of them in your text. Uh, for sure, people probably said he didn't really do these things. They didn't see it. They say that's just people exaggerating Jesus. He didn't really do the things that they say he did. Others saw him do them, and the, the religious leaders wrote it off to the work of the devil. They say Jesus does this by the work of the devil. Other people say they don't want Jesus because he's not the Messiah they're looking for. Right? They're looking for a warlord to overthrow Rome, and Jesus comes riding on a, donk a donkey, humble, meek. Others feared Jesus would mean the end of their influence. John eleven forty seven, 47, we read that the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do for if this man performs many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And they're fearing that they'll be removed from their place of influence and authority. And there's a variety of excuses that people give for why they won't believe in Jesus, and the variety of excuses exist even today as to why people won't believe in Jesus. Reminds me of a story that I heard of in World War II. Uh, there were the big, th there were what's called the Big Three Conference, which was between Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. And the meetings were to have to deal with the war and stopping the, the expansion of Germany, the Nazis. And Churchill and Roosevelt present their plan, and Stalin rejects their plan. And after he rejects their plan, and and won't go along with it. Churchill and Roosevelt say, that's not any real excuse. And then Stalin tells them a story of two Arabs. And one Arab said to the other, let me borrow your rope. And the other one said, I can't. I need it to tie my camel. And the other one said, but you don't even have a camel. To which the other Arab replied, but when you don't want to let anybody borrow your rope, one excuse is as good as another. And that is what unbelief is like. And when we see in John's gospel, and even today, when you don't want to believe in Jesus, any excuse is as good as another. But what I want to know is how does John explain their unbelief? He doesn't give an excuse, but he does explain it. Why is Jesus' public ministry marked by such wide scale? unbelief in the face of such clear gospel revelation. Now, this is a challenging text before us to grapple with. It's about unbelief. And the ultimate reason why they don't believe. So let's kind of unpack just the flow of it to begin with. If you look back at your text at verse 37, even though he had done so many signs before them, still they did not believe. Verse 38... Our text tells us this fulfills Isaiah 53, which we'll return to, fulfills prophecy. Verse 39, 
Therefore, they could not believe. Statement of ability. They can't believe. Because God blinded their eyes. Verse 40. God blinded their eyes and he hardened their hearts lest they see and understand and turn and God would heal him, heal them, which is a direct quote of Isaiah 6.10. Why did the Jewish people reject Jesus? Well, the simple answer is they rejected the revelation that was given to them, though he had done so many signs before them. They still did not believe. But the difficult part is clearly in verse 39 and 40, isn't it? Isn't that the difficult part? Because the text says that God blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they could not believe. Isn't that what it says? If you look back at your text, does it not clearly say that? Now, I know that makes you uncomfortable. And it makes many Bible commentators uncomfortable and many preachers uncomfortable so that you, if you read many Bible commentators, they will, they will make the text say exactly what it doesn't say. Right? They'll give you every reason that it doesn't say what it clearly says. And I would just say, if you ever hear a preacher telling you what your own eyes tell you the Bible says, it's time to leave. It's time to take your commentary and throw it in the fireplace. It creates a real tension. And I know that, and I'm aware of that. And I want, you, I want to help you make sense of what the text says. Because the text says God hardened them and blinded them so they couldn't believe in Jesus. So, to help you understand this, uh, here's some ground rules I want to give you for interpreting the Bible. Some ground rules for interpreting the Bible and interpreting difficult texts like this, which make the sovereignty of God collide with man's responsibility. Number one, you need to always remember that God is God and you're not God. Very popular today in interpreta you know, interpretation for Reformed preachers to remind people, you're not David. Don't read the David story and think, that's about you and your giants, right? You're not David. But what you need to remember is, you're not God. And just when I tell you you're not God, you don't get to decide what God says about himself. If you're here today... And you're, maybe you're not a Christian, it just creates a, an automatic response in your spirit. It's involuntary. It's like a heartbeat. Your heart beats without you thinking about it. When I tell you you're not God, you don't get to decide what God says about himself. Your flesh revolts against that because you so very much want to be God. And you so very much want to import your ideas about God into the Bible and say, God would never do that. That's not fair. God is God, we aren't. We don't get to say what's fair, and we don't get to say what God would do. It would be helpful if there was like maybe a whole chapter in the Bible to help us grapple with this. Do you think it would be? Well, there is. It's called Romans chapter 9. And in Romans chapter 9, Paul is grappling with this very question. And the question at hand is, has God's promises failed? There are no, why is Israel not believing in their Messiah? The very thing we're dealing with in our text, right? Why such wide-scale unbelief? Have the promises of God failed? And he says, by no means. I'm a Jew. God's promises haven't failed. And then he goes into a section about election. Some people are getting triggered right now. Election. And he says, this is a demonstration of God's sovereign election. He gives an uh, illustration from the Old Testament. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated of individual election, and he, and, he, and he predicts people's response. He predicts your response. He's going to say, you're going to say there's injustice on God's part. That's what you're going to say. So in Romans 9, 14 through 20, we read this. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Here's the most, the most expressive, adamant negation that he can give in the language is by no means, exclamation point. By no means. There is not injustice on God's part. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. 
For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, so that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whom he has, on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. And then he predicts what you're going to say next. You will then say, why does he still find fault? And then he says, but who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Who are you to tell God what he can do? That's Paul's answer. Paul mentions Pharaoh, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 4.21, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now we'll return to Pharaoh in a moment when we ask and answer the question, how does God harden a human heart? But the first principle we must never forget is God is God and you are not God. We don't get to tell God what he can do. Second principle is this. You must understand this. And it's a category, it's a, it's a massive error. God doesn't harden people that don't deserve to be hardened. The, the, the starting place is usually wrong. People usually think of the Bible this way. They think humanity deserves to be saved. Humanity deserves grace from God. They deserve a chance to be saved. <clears throat> but then it wouldn't be grace. Grace isn't grace if you deserve it. So the second principle you have to get is God doesn't harden anybody's heart that doesn't deserve to be hardened. When he hardens a heart, it's just. And it's an error to think the default human position is that of innocence or that of deserving anything from God. Jesus does not come into a world that deserves to be saved. He doesn't come into a world that's neutral. He comes into a world that's already fallen, already guilty before God, already lost, already condemned and under the wrath of God. That's the world that God sends his son into, already condemned. John 3.18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Already under condemnation. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You're already dead in sin. You're following the course of this world. You're already under the wrath of God. That's what Paul tells us clearly in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. You're by nature children of wrath. That's a default position. That's a default human condition. Already did in sin, already under the wrath of God, already condemned. So when God hardens any person, it is just for him to harden them. When he doesn't harden a heart or softens it and saves a person, that's grace. That's what they don't deserve. We deserve to be hardened. So first principle, God is God. We aren't. Second principle, God doesn't harden people that don't deserve to be hardened. Number three, God's sovereignty and human responsibility are never pitted against each other in the Bible. The Bible affirms God's absolute sovereignty over all things, including humanity and unbelief and belief. And the Bible also affirms clearly that you are responsible to repent and believe the gospel. And anybody that pits one against the other is failing to give you the whole counsel of God's word. But there's one more principle you cannot forget. When God hardens a people, it reveals his justice and reveals his glory. So now, the question, how does God harden a human heart? How does God harden a human heart to where we could not accuse God of doing something wrong? Now, here's the biblical answer. And we'll work through it, and I want to show it to you. Here's the answer. He removes what we could call restraining grace. He removes restraining grace, and he gives revelation, which is already hated. 
For instance, if you go to Romans chapter 1, we have a long section that Paul gives about humanity and culture in general and what it looks like when God judges a culture. And it begins with humanity rejecting the clear revelation of God in nature called general revelation, that all men have access to this nature from God everywhere. His divine attributes have clearly perceived in all things that are made, and we reject it. And then there's a repeated phrase that God gave them up. And it, if you turn to Romans 1 and read it later, you'll see it. I'll read to you a few times. Romans 1, 24, here's what it says. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves. So God gives them up. They go and they fully indulge in the sin that they want. He, restrain, he removes all restraint and lets them go after it which continues the cascade. So in Romans 1.26, we read again, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for those contrary to nature. So God removes more grace, more restraining grace, and people dive deeper into sin. He, he continues to remove restraining grace, Romans 1.28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. He removes grace even further. Man plunges deeper and deeper into sin, the heart growing harder and harder and colder and colder as God simply removes grace. God's righteous judgment falls upon a society as he removes his restraining grace and lets people go their own way. And when he does, people's hearts grow cold and hard. Now, back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh says a lot to our text. We'll return to our text, but we need to understand Pharaoh. The first theology class I ever had was Old Testament 1 in 2010, I believe. And in that class, there was a big debate, and it was done on purpose by our professor, and it was, who hardened Pharaoh's heart? And in the class, it was really, looking back, you can clearly see there are people arguing for their own theological perspectives, right? You got the Arminian freewheelers, and they're like, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And they'll argue, argue, argue from their theological system. And you have those on the more reformed camp. that say, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And they emphasize God's sovereignty and his power over all things and his right to do with his creatures as he sees and they're arguing from these systems. But when we look at the text of Pharaoh, what do we see? Who, who hardened God's heart? Or, or who hardened Pharaoh's heart? God or Pharaoh? And the answer is both. God hardened Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. It's kind of like who killed Saul. Right? The Bible affirms that God killed Saul. And the Bible also affirms Saul killed himself. The text says, I believe, nine times that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. The text also says, I think three or four times, that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 9, 12, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them as the Lord spoke to Moses. Then, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. We read in 8, 12, the plagues, the frogs are everywhere, right? And then God gives him a little break from the plagues, and Moses intercedes, and the, the plague stops. They pile all the frogs up in little heaps. And what, is, what happens? Does he listen? He doesn't listen. Here's what it says. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. So principle one, God is God. God told Moses, go, preach to Pharaoh. He's not going to listen. I'm going to harden his heart. Principle two, pa Pharaoh is a pagan idolater. He's guilty. He's condemned, and it's just and right for God to harden his heart. Principle three, Pharaoh hardens his own heart because the sovereignty of God is never pitted against human responsibility. But how does God do it? Maybe you're wondering. How does God harden a human heart, ensuring that it happens, and yet the person hardens their own heart? Well, I think here's the answer. Number one, God has removed all restraining grace from Pharaoh. Think who it is to be Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the most powerful sinner on the face of the earth. 
There is not a single person keeping Pharaoh in check. There's no board or council to restrain any lust of his heart, any evil deed, any wickedness that he desires. There is no one to restrain Pharaoh. So God has removed every measure of accountability. Anything that could restrain his evil heart, God has removed it. So much so that this man, Pharaoh, professes to be a god. God has removed all restraining grace from Pharaoh. Number two, God gives Pharaoh revelation, which he hates. He tells Moses, go speak to Pharaoh. Now, how does Moses come to speak to Pharaoh? Pharaoh is thinking himself a god seated on his throne, and here comes Moses. And God says, I will make you like God to Pharaoh. Exodus 7, 4, the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. You shall speak all I command you to speak. Reality check. Here comes the prophet of God speaking the word of God. And the man who thinks he's a God knows he's not a God anymore. And he hates the revelation of God spoken through Moses So that he rejects that revelation. And then when the plagues subside, he hardens his heart even more. You see how it works? God gives Pharaoh what he knows he hates and that which will harden his heart even more. The words of Moses, which are the words of God, spoken through the prophet, and the signs and the wonders. And Pharaoh hardens his own heart. First principle, God is God. He's right because Pharaoh is, second, Pharaoh is not innocent. He's right to harden this sinner's heart. And yet, number three, we see Pharaoh hardens his own heart. His responsibility is affirmed. Principle four, God's hardening of a people reveals his justice and his glory. What is the result of God hardening Pharaoh's heart? Well, the result is... The whole world hears the name Yahweh. The wonders of Yahweh are spoken of throughout the whole world as God pours out his righteous judgment upon Egypt and totally decimates them, making a mockery of every god of the Egyptians along the, along the path. And then finally, in the Passover comes, God producing this miraculous deliverance for his people, this great exodus, which is a foreshadow of a greater exodus to come in Christ and his name is praised throughout all of the earth because he hardens Pharaoh's heart. Now, with these principles in mind, back to our text. How does God blind the eyes of the Jewish people so that they are so hardened that they cannot believe? They're to the the point of no return and as a result, they will crucify Jesus. Keep in mind, number one, God is God. He does as he will. Number two, keep in mind these people are already guilty before God. They have already rejected Jesus' revelation time and time and time again. Though he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe. Number three, God's sovereignty and human responsibility, as we'll see, are affirmed in the text. And this brings us, as we look at our text... We need to take note of how it's presented to us. It's presented to us from two quotes from Isaiah. So look back at your text, you'll see it. Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 6. And they both both tell us something, I think, on how God hardens them here. John tells us in verse 41, this is the key principle. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. We're told the interpretive key. Isaiah's prophecies then were about Jesus. He he sees Jesus in Isaiah 6. He speaks of Jesus in Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant. This is about Jesus. So Isaiah 53, 1 is quoted first. Look back at your text. You'll see it. He says, so the word that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then he quotes it. Now, Isaiah 53 1 through 3 says this, 
Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So, first, what is this telling us? I think this is what it tells us. How does God harden their heart? Answer, he gives them a Messiah that they don't want. God has decreed from eternity past, ensuring the crucifixion will take place because when their Messiah comes, it's not the Messiah that they're looking for. And this theme has already come up repeatedly in John's gospel. If you remember, he has no majesty, Isaiah 53 tells us, there's no majesty. When you look at Jesus, there's nothing about him that you would say, hey, clearly the Messiah, you'd see him, he's just another man. He's a, a man that has no manly glory about him, right? You would look at Jesus and you wouldn't say it's clearly God in the flesh. You wouldn't look at Jesus and say, yes, there's that warlord Messiah that I've been waiting for, which is what they're looking for. So, oh, he's so magnificent. He's so beautiful. Let's follow him. Right? He's not Maccabee. Remember that from Israel's history? He's not Maccabee, round two. This isn't King Saul, who, to who towers above all the rest, is a head and shoulders above all the rest, and is handsome. The obvious choice to be king. This, this is not who Jesus is. He's lowly. He's humble. He's meek. He's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, a one from whom men hide their faces. And this is the Messiah that, that God gives them and provides. And so they reject this Messiah. He's not the Messiah that they want. His meekness, his humility, it hardens them. Rather than draw them in, it hardens, it hardens them in their unbelief. Second, they're hardened by Jesus' preaching. Jesus' preaching hardened their hearts. And we get this from Isaiah 6. Verse 39 tells us, Therefore they could not believe. For Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal him. Well, if you go back to Isaiah 6, which we read in full earlier in our Scripture reading, Isaiah gets that vision, right, of the holiness and the majesty of God. And he's... He knows he's a sinner before this holy God. We see this great picture of redemption as God forgives him of his sins. And Isaiah, having been transformed by the vision of a holy and righteous God, God says, who will go for us? I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then he's ready, right? He is a here I am, send me. I'm ready to be a preacher of this glorious God to tell everybody about your glory and your beauty, and your power. And God says, okay, here's how you're going to go be a preacher. <clears throat> you're going to go, and you're going to say, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. And your preaching is going to make the people's hearts dull. Their ears are going to be heavy. Their eyes are going to be blind. They're not going to see. Your preaching is going to blind them so they can't believe. And how long am I to preach like that? until all cities lie desolate, until the judgment of God falls on them. How's that for a preaching ministry? How many converts will, will I have, God? How many souls will I win? Zero. Your preaching is going to pound their heart into hardness. It's like on a pitcher's mound. Have you guys ever seen them prepare a baseball field? They have, the mound is made out of clay. You may not know that. A pitcher's mound's made out of clay. And so they take a tamp and they hammer the tamp down on the pitcher's mound. And as they hammer it and they beat it and they beat it, the clay doesn't get softer. It gets harder and harder until it's nearly as hard as like concrete. That's Isaiah's preaching. Go and preach. No one's going to repent. You're going to preach of my glory. They hate my glory. It's going to harden them. Until they can't believe, they're at the point of no return. And they're going to judge them. Jesus' ministry 
and his preaching is as Isaiah's ministry. Isaiah preached the glory of God, but the glory of God has come and is preaching. And they, they hate it. They hate his words. So rather than repent and turn, his preaching has rendered their heart so hard that they can't believe. That's what the text says. Spurgeon has said it clear. It's a, it's a great picture. The same sun that melts wax hardens clay. The preaching of Jesus is a, is a grace. His sheep hear his voice and listen to him. But the widespread unbelief is explained that his preaching is the preaching God knows. They will reject, and which will take them deeper and deeper into unbelief, rendering them blind, taking them to the place where believing is no longer possible, ensuring the crucifixion will take place, which leads us to point four. God's hardening of a people reveals his justice and his glory. If the people had not been hardened sovereignly by God, there would be no salvation for you. You would be lost right now and condemned in your sins and under the wrath of God, and we would die and spend eternity in hell if God had not hardened sovereignly the hearts of these people so that they would reject him and crucify him. Paul discusses this in Romans 11, just a little taste. Romans 11, 25. He's speaking about us Gentiles becoming prideful about our being included and God's people, he says, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening, hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. God sovereignly hardens them so that they will crucify Christ. So that he, could, he will die on the cross, not for his sins, but for my sins and for your sins. God's sovereignty ensures his justice and his glory will be revealed at the cross. But John isn't finished because in verse 42 and 43, he gives us clear insight into the human responsibility of this. And it's kind of scary to look at this text. Look at it, verse 42 through 43. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And this is what is the kernel, maybe the root of unbelief. This isn't real belief. How do I know that? Because Jesus tells us this is not real saving faith and saving belief. In Luke 9, 26, he says, Anyone that is ashamed of me and my words... Of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes with the glory of the Father and his holy angels. It's not real saving belief because they love the glory of man. What's the root? Why don't they openly profess Christ? They made some type of mental ascent, maybe. Maybe they're lining things up. They love man's glory. They love the glory of man more than they love God's glory. Isn't that sad to think? They would rather be applauded by men than to be welcomed and seeking the glory of God. They're seeking their own glory from men. John Calvin said this. It's a vivid picture, I think. Earthly honors are golden chains that bind men. Earthly honors are golden chains that bind men. Jesus tells these Pharisees, he tells them a long time ago in John chapter 5, he told them why they can't believe in him. And he tells them this, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? How can you believe? And the answer is, you can't. As long as you are seeking the glory of man, you cannot believe to believe is to love the glory of God and to forsake the glory of man. And this section explains the wide-scale unbelief of the Jewish people to us. It explains how, in light of all this revelation, they don't believe. 
but it also reminds us of Jesus' ministry and what his ministry was marked by and about. We see that in the next section. Jesus' public ministry is marked by clear gospel invitations. If you look back at your text, you'll see it clear as day. Verses 44 through 50, another clear gospel presentation to tell you this is what Jesus' public ministry was all about. Here's what it's about. Verse 44 through 45 tell us that Jesus was sent by the Father. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus was sent by the Father to save. The Father has given his only Son the very best of all that he has. This is what Jesus' ministry is about. Sent on a mission from the Father to save. Jesus tells us, the tight link of the relationship between him and the Father. It's so tight. Whoever sees me sees him who sent me. And we'll see later that he'll say this to his disciples. To see Jesus is to see God. So what is God like? Well, God is Christ-like. God is Christ-like. There's no having the Father, despite what the world tells us. There's no having the Father. There's no having a relationship with the Father. There's no other ways to get to the Father except for through the Son. Whoever has the Son has the Father. Who does, whoever does not have the Son does not have the Father. John will explain this in his epistle. There's only one Son. There's only one Son sent by the Father. And if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. That's Jesus' public ministry. And we're summarizing it now. Then verse 46 through 48, we move on to another element of Jesus' public ministry. Jesus says, clearly, the world is in darkness. But I've come as light into this darkness. And I've come as light into this darkness so that people might be saved. His mission was not judgment. If you look back at your text, doesn't he say it? His mission was not judgment. It was to bring salvation. I've come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus came to save the world, John 3, 17 says. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus came on a salvation Mission. He didn't come on a judgment mission. He came to save. And yet, the world will be judged. This is the third thing we see about Jesus' public ministry. The world will be judged by Jesus' words. Look back at your text. You'll see it clearly. The emphasis on Jesus' words. In verses 48 through 50, his words, he speaks... Only what the Father tells him to speak. His words judge the world. Now, it took me a minute, a minute to get this. Thinking about John's gospel and the themes that John is repeatedly giving us. Look back at your text. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. You will be judged by Jesus' words, what he spoke. What did he speak? He didn't speak on his own authority, verse 49. He spoke what the Father sent him and gave him to speak. He gave him a commandment, what to say, what to speak. In verse 50, what is this commandment? Eternal life. And what therefore I say, I say as the Father has given me. Repeated themes in John's gospel help us to understand this. He uses the term commandment. He uses the words that he speaks, what the Father gives him to speak. I had to grapple with this for a bit. I think it's pretty clear that Jesus says right up front, you're going to be judged by the words that he's spoken. God's word will stand up and condemn you on the last day. Have you responded to Christ and his word or have you not? But there's also a, a deeper element here. As Jesus equates his words with a commandment. And you'll remember that Jesus is presented as one greater than, right? At the woman at the well. Are you greater than, are you greater than Jacob who gave us this well? And the answer is yes. 
I have a greater water to give you, a water that wells up to eternal life. Jesus is greater than the temple. Destroy the temple. I'll rebuild this temple in three days. Jesus is greater than the Passover, greater than the manna in the desert, because I am this living bread that has come down from heaven. And Jesus is presented over and over as greater than all of these in the Old Testament. But we're told in the prologue of John's gospel something that we should keep in mind. And we're told Jesus is greater than Moses. John 1, 14 through 18 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. From His fullness we have received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Moses brought you a commandment, the law. Jesus says here, I have a commandment, eternal life, the gospel. Jesus is greater than Moses. He brings, as he speaks the command of God, repent and believe the gospel and have eternal life. And this word will judge you because it's God's command. He commands you. Every man, every woman, every child here today, God commands you, repent and believe the gospel. This is God's word. This is, God, this is Christ's mission to speak these words of life sent by the Father. Father's own sacrifice for sin, crucified, buried, raised on the third day, speaking the commands of God. Eternal life. Today, two summary statements of Jesus' public ministry. That's what we've seen. Jesus' public ministry is marked by unbelief. Jesus' public ministry is marked by clear gospel invitations. Now, a few direct applications. Just a few. If you are saved today, if you are a Christian today under the grace of God, you must marvel that God did not harden your heart as he could, he could have done so justly. He could have hardened your heart through the preaching of the gospel so that you end up condemned and lost for eternity. So if you're here today and you're a Christian, you must be thankful and marvel that the preaching of the gospel it melted your heart and didn't harden your heart, and God called you in grace to believe in Jesus. Be thankful. Number two, heed the stark warning that John has for all people. There isn't a single person that has ever lived that has not craved the glory of man. And so I ask you today, is the glory of man wanting the approval of the world, wanting the approval of your friends, wanting the approval of your family, maybe your mother or your father, maybe wanting the approval of your children or your co-workers or your boss, whoever it is. Is the glory of man keeping you from the glory of God? There's not a single person who has not been tempted in this fashion. But heed this warning. Trust Christ while you have light. If you've never trusted Christ, trust Christ while you have light. Obey his command and believe the gospel. While the light is among you, respond to the light so that you might become children of the light. And Paul will say, behold, now is the appointed time. Now is the day of salvation. While God's light is shining, do not reject it. So the more you reject God, the harder your heart gets. 
And the harder your heart gets, you hear the gospel, you reject it, your heart grows colder, it grows harder. And then one day, you'll be like these folks who have so rejected the grace of God that you can, cannot believe. Believe today while the light of the gospel shines. Believe the gospel. Charles Spurgeon recounts the words of a dying doctor. Doctor on his deathbed. I love to look at people's deathbed words. Dr. Hugh of Glasgow said this, There is nothing I feel more than the criminality of not trusting Christ. Without doubt, without doubt. Oh, to think what Christ is and what he did and whom he did it for and then to not believe in him, not to trust him. There is no wickedness like the wickedness of unbelief. If you're here today and you're in your unbelief, turn from this wickedness. Turn from your unbelief today. Obey the command of Christ his command is eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we love your word. Help us, God, today to trust you, to believe how you have revealed yourself in your word, one who is sovereign over all of history. God, help us those that are believers, God, to not take our salvation lightly, but to marvel at it. God, that you did not give us what we justly deserved. You did not pass us over. You did not harden us. God, you, you used the means in the preaching of the gospel and maybe parents or teachers or friends to bring us the gospel, God, and you brought us to belief through the gospel. Help us, God, to be thankful. And if there are those here that remain in unbelief, God, I pray, God, that you would break through their unbelief. May your word be like a hammer that breaks rock. May you give them a new heart, regenerate them, cause them to run to Christ today in Jesus' name. Amen.